Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Katherine Garforth from Garforth Education, and this is a Right to Read initiative. Today, I have the pleasure of having Donna Heitmanek from the Reading Science, What I Wish I Had Known in College group. She created that group, and in Canada, we refer to her affectionately as Donna from the big group. Um, <laughs> And I'm so excited to have you here to discuss, you know, why this group came to be and relate those to some of the Ontario Human Rights Commission's Right to Read Public Inquiry Recommendations. Now, this report was released on February 28th, and it came with 157 recommendations. And this talk, we're gonna try and focus on a section of those, 48 to 58, which are covering concepts that include ensuring pre-service teacher preparation addresses critical concepts and ensuring educational, ensuring additional qualification courses and continuing professional development address critical components. And these are all looking at best practices for reading instruction. So thank you for joining me today, Donna. Why don't you take a minute and introduce yourself and how you got to this position? Thanks, Catherine, for having me. Um, so um, I had a really nice, quiet life and I retired after teaching 41 years and I thought, mm, this is going to be great. And then I um, a year after I retired, um, I was very active in, in Wisconsin with legislation, and we had spent a year prior, the year I actually retired, I served on a board called uh, a dyslexia study group. And from that study group, uh, we were able to bring forth a, um, a bill on a dyslexia guidebook for Wisconsin. So the opposition we had was they didn't want the word dyslexia used in the guidebook. Well, it's a dyslexia study group. So, you know, we did get what we, what we needed. However, um, it, it came at a cost because we spent the summer down in Madison, our capital, just doing lots and lots of, um, testimonials. And so, um, I remember clear the, the day I was there, I was, I was, um, testifying in the Senate Education Committee. And I said, <laughs> I'm going to write a book one day and it's going to be called The Science of Reading, What I Should Have Learned in College. I said, because we're not teaching what we need to know to be effective reading teachers in college. And well, I never wrote the book, but I discovered Facebook had these things called groups. I never knew about that. And I, I put one together and within months, I mean, we were just growing by leaps and bounds. So, and then the pandemic really um, accelerated our growth because people were stuck at home. Um, and I think that's across the board. Most, most of the science of reading uh, sites just grew exponentially. And so out of a bad thing came something really good. Definitely. I know several teachers that in their pre-service training, they're like, okay, so I know what to do once they're reading, but how do we teach them to read? Yep. And I remember asking that question in my own pre-service training and they're like, oh, don't worry. You know, it happens naturally. And I'm like, what about the dyslexics kids being a dyslexic myself and knowing that it doesn't always happen naturally. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're like, oh, don't worry the special education teacher will take care of that. And at the time of my teacher education, uh, that's where all the new teachers are going uh, who are trying to get contracts because they were the positions that needed to be filled. I'm like, okay, so right. coming out of this, I'm likely gonna get the partial special education contract, but you're not teaching me the skills I'm gonna need to address these students. It's so true. So true. And in fact, um, my story, so I graduated in 1976 with a special, don't laugh, you were not probably even born yet, um, with a, um, a degree in special education. And um, 
none of my training had any of science-based instruction. We did have phonics though. I mean, that was included. And then fast forward um, to, to 2011, um, I got a new position. It was a reading specialist and I had to have a reading certificate. And so yeah, I, I took this course online and it was awful. It was, it was awful. It was basically reading recovery just in, under new label. And um, um, Dr. Dykstra from Wisconsin, um, some of you may know him, he, um, he complained for me to our Department of Public Instruction and kind of snitched on the school that I was attending. And I get a call from the program manager and she's chewing me up one side and down the next and says, um, uh, you know, you can leave the program, you know, find somewhere else to go. And I said, Oh, no, I won't be doing that. So I, you know, everybody knew, oh, Donna's going to be in the next class, you know, so I, <laughs> I, <laughs> my, my reputation preceded me. So, but anyway, I got through it. It was a painful process. I asked my husband, I screamed and yelled the whole way, um, because everything I learned was nothing to teach the kids that we would be charged with. And those are the kids that are strugglers. So it was just such a, a waste of $7,000, very frustrating. And, but I did learn that, um, be, you know, I learned that nothing had changed in our education system. And that actually gave me ammunition when I did testify because I actually went through that process. So it served me well. Unfortunately, it doesn't serve the teachers well. So how did you come to find the science of reading? So I, oh, that was, oh, that's such a great question. In, in 80, so I had been teaching about 12 years and I found this course um, through in, 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 in Illinois. I was from Illinois at the time. And um, it was a class that Dr. Enfield and Dr. Green from Project Read out of Minnesota, they were teaching the, the phonology class and the comprehension class. And I'm going to get chills because it was like, oh my gosh, this is the secret sauce, right? This is what we didn't learn in college. And so I was armed with some ammunition to help my kiddos that were really struggling. And that's how I started. And then it just snowballed. And then I moved to Wisconsin and I ran into, um, it, you know, it's just this crazy small world how this stuff happens. Um, doc, Dr. Lee Ganshaw, who taught at Miami University, who taught, you know, kids with dyslexia and bilingual kids. And so she was super connected. She was a retired professor here. And she, she, I, you know, I, I heard about her, you know, because it was in the newspaper and she needed someone to help with the task force. Um, so, so, of course, you know, I signed up to help on the task force and it was immediately promoted within a year to the presidency. <laughs> and, but what's so cool was um, Dr. Marsha Henry, she was our instructor for the courses that we had in the summer. So, because she lived in Wisconsin, she lived in, on Madeline Island. So she would come down and, and teach these courses. And we talk about how the stars aligned, right? Mm -hmm. And it's just, and so now, you know, we fast forward and that was in, that was 04, 2004, we started. Um, in 2021, I took over the task force again. And um, we are now bringing things forth throughout Wisconsin at a rapid pace and, um, and, and actually helping, you know, the science of reading page as well. So we're a joint effort. It works together. And um, it's been remarkable exciting work. Well, and I, you know, you mentioned that it all started in the eighties that you were getting this information. Mm -hmm. And you know, what? just last night I picked up a book that I've had in my shelf for years and I've read before, but beginning to read by Marilyn, Marilyn Adams. Adams. And I was reading through the foreword and you know, that was just the first chapter. I'm like, okay, so this, I think it was published in 1990. Uh -huh. This is all stuff that we've known for 30 right. years. Right. And it's not 
there and there's no excuse. You know, and I had this epiphany yesterday. It just like, it was like, what is the reason that we can't get instructors in college to understand the missing link, that missing piece? You know, if if they're worth their salt, you know, they are going to be um, investigating all the recent research, right? That's what you're supposed to be doing as a professor. And, and what's preventing that from happening in our schools of ed? I, I, I don't understand that. And, um, and I don't mean to belittle them. I think what happens is, is that um, people hang out in their circles of influence together. And so if, if you're in one circle and you believe one approach and that's, that's the only thing you study, and those are the only researchers you know, so that's what you're going to study. Um, and the, the, the borders never get crossed, which is kind of why it turns into this crazy war. And it shouldn't, you know, we, we shouldn't be fighting about this. Um, and the other thing that frustrates me is the fact that there's so much brain research that just, you know, you can't refute it and yet it's being denied by the non-believers so yeah and I mean at least up here you know at the the local universities one of the problems that I see is that that teacher education program has different um, parts to it so there's the special education part and the language literacy and education part and the research that's coming out about best practices in teaching and reading is typically from, you know, the neuroscience, the special education, the school psychology side of things, but it's not making its way to the language literacy and education mm-hmm. side of the equation. And there's just this roadblock in between. Right. And mm-hmm. it's building bridges and then the bureaucracy that's in play mm-hmm. um, because of tenureship and um, ego. Right. That's true. Down to, right. So something we've been doing here in Wisconsin, and this is how it got started about two and a half years ago, two, two years ago, um, two and a half. I'm going to take that back. Uh, a, a school district that I was consulting in got a flyer from one of our local universities, and it was about getting a, a reading certificate, or we call it a 316. It's your reading teacher certificate. And so um, the special ed director, she said, is this program any good? So I went and looked up the professor's background and training, and it was all reading recovery, whole language. And I said, no, this program isn't going to work. So she said, um, she says, I'm just going to, I'm just going to call them up and tell them that this isn't good for us. And so she did, she had a conversation with them and she said, you know, if you want us to send students to your school, you need to change how you approach reading. Well, you know, she, she wasn't too happy about that, but she was willing to meet with me and the special ed director. So we had a very uncomfortable conversation at first, but I have to give her credit because she, I sent her lots of things afterwards, you know, to kind of wet her whistle and she was in, intrigued by it. And so now we have this pretty good working relationship But not only that, I've got other schools on board. Um, One of our biggest opposers um, has started looking at the research and she, she agreed, you know, that you can't, you can't dispute this. And so she's on a journey. And in fact, she created, good for Wisconsin, um, a dyslexia certificate that uh, teachers can get. And then another school developed a dyslexia certificate. So it's catching on. So we are, um, I have about six people in this cohort, and then um, we're looking to expand and do some letters training with, with these folks. And so, um, so I, I put it out on our Wisconsin Facebook page. 
And I got 17 prof um, professors and adjunct that, are, that wanna take the letters course. Mm -hmm. So I am so excited that this is going to be happening. This is, this is huge for Wisconsin. So, you know, it can be done, but it's about building relationships. This doesn't happen when you come in and you plow your way through and say, you know, you're not doing it right. You have to, you have to ease in, you have to find common ground and, and explain, well, here's what I'm thinking. Here's what the research is saying. What do you think? You know, that sort of conversation. Um, Dr. Stoller, Stephanie Stoller is doing a nice job. She's got a uh, training reading rocket scientist Facebook page, and she's doing the same. She's got, I don't know, maybe four or 500. I'm not sure how many she's got on that page of all professor, excuse me, professors and um, uh, adjunct that are, you know, get together and share information and that building bridges. Yeah, it, it's so important. And it, it can be very difficult because when you're in that situation, when you're having someone tell you that you're wrong and you don't know what you're talking about, mm -hmm. and you know, you're, you're hurting their ego, you're hurting their education. Mm -hmm. And it, they get in that very defensive stance, but at the same time, your passion is just, look, we're trying to work towards the common goal. How can we achieve that? Mm -hmm. Adam Grant says in his book, um, to remember the name of his book, doesn't matter. He, uh, think again, I think it's called. And he said, when change is occurring, you have to find the one thing that will stay the same or several things that will stay the same because nobody likes complete change. So you have to reassure, you know, whoever you're trying to convince that this is going to stay the same, but this needs to change. And, you know, and that's how you can help get that change initiated. Yeah. So in the group, what do you find are the big common threads that keep on coming up time and time again? Mm -hmm. Um, it's interesting because a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, so we're going on three years in, in August, we'll be three years old. Um, about a year and a half ago, we had very, um, simplistic questions, just, you know, where do I start? I don't know what to do. Um, is this science of reading? A lot of that, you know looking at curriculum, is this, is this aligned to the science? See, people don't understand what that means. Um, and so we encourage our membership to get training, you know, go and get training because that's how you're going to learn. And that's how you're going to familiarize yourself with what the research is saying. And not only just once, get it a couple times because you have to hear it a couple times for it to sink in. You know, and every time you go to a new training, it's you hear something new and it's it's maybe presented in a different way that you didn't hear it before. Um, but that's helpful. You know, that's that's how we learn. Um, so that's that's what I'm seeing a lot of. Um, what do what do I do? However, just recently, I've noticed um, the questions are a little more sophisticated. The discussion is a little more sophisticated. Um, and I think it's because people are educating themselves, you know, sure. We have, we have brand spanking new members to the science. They are, they are, you know, raw. They don't know really, they don't even know really what it means. Uh, but someone told them to join our group. Right. So, um, you know, so they come on and, um, they ask good questions. Uh, we do have a policy that we try to enforce that, um, they can't um, really add to a conversation, just ask questions um, because we don't want false information being shared. And that help, that has helped. Um, we give everyone a welcome letter when they join and kind of lead them down. Okay, this will start your science of reading journey. Um, so that's that's been good. Yeah, well, and it's so hard to know where to start because there are so many different options out there. Yes. And there's a lot of rebranding that's happening for programs that are not 
aligned. Right. And um, people that have been big in the whole language and balanced literacy approaches to teaching reading that are saying that they are aligning their practices when they're just taking those big, you know, swag words and mm -hmm. salt and peppering them into the curriculum and say that they're doing it and that they're aligning their processes and their, their curriculum with the right words, but they don't have a thorough understanding of what they're actually trying exactly. to do. That's true. So I'm doing a presentation next week um, for a, a group that is, is trying to make the shift, you know? Um, and so uh, there's probably going to be maybe 20 teachers there, a couple of uh, administrators. And so I put together a presentation about if you're, if you're stuck in a balanced literacy curriculum, and many, many teachers are, here are some things you can do to modify um, practices to, to better align to the science. So, you know, you can't change everything, um, especially when there's money involved. You know, um, I listened to a podcast today about a school district, you know, they just bought curriculum for a million dollars and, <laughs> and it, it, you know, there, there's a five-year cycle for their curriculum and it was their second year and they're not going to change. So what, what do you tell these districts? You know, you, you, there are some things you can automatically do. And I always say, this is my first go-to drop three queuing. That's the very first thing doesn't cost a dime and it'll really help your kiddos learn how to look at the whole word as opposed to just uh, skipping it or the picture. Definitely. And, you know, it, it's a slow process. Research is telling us that moving from a balanced literacy to a structured literacy or a reading science approach to reading instruction is going to take, you know, three to five years. So if this district that just spent the million dollars on the curriculum begins that cycle, when they're at the point to be fully immersed in it, they can have that spending because another mistake that can easily be made is say, okay, we're switching. Let's just buy a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, and the, the other thing is um, it's not just about the curriculum. You have to look at the systems that are in place so your MTSS system, what is that like? You have to look at your assessments. Of course, you're looking at your core curriculum. You wanna look at your uh, intervention curriculum. You wanna look at teacher training. You wanna look at schedules. What are the schedules like? Um, how, are the, how are the teachers working together? Are they working together? Or are they working against each other? Um, can they uh, collaborate? Can they switch classes? That sort of thing. Um, are there routines in the day that could be used for everyone to um, it, across the grades? So for example, I was in a, I'm in a school that, um, is being um, is is going through a change, and they're I think they're in their fourth year, um, and so they they have a company um, that comes in and does an evaluation. That's how it started. They come in, they do an evaluation about your your you know your systems, your structures, your assessments, your curriculum, you know, and they they didn't they failed every single part of the evaluation but then they're given homework okay i want you to do this and this and this and it's a process that the school district has to go through and what makes it effective is the leadership you have to have leaders that a know what the science is about and b see this as an urgent problem yeah, there has to be urgency in how our leadership is is taking this uh, as a problem, you know, do you like having 40% of your kids um, doing fine and 60% are failing? And that's just, that's just not acceptable. So, you know, there's got to be that urgency. And then, um, and then when you put all that together, you know, your curriculum, your systems, your structures, your routines. Um, oh, I was going to talk about this routine that the, the school district uses, they adopted it. Um, and it's a vocabulary routine. So the kids 
the kids stand up and they say the word. The teacher has the word on a, on a, um, a whiteboard, not a whiteboard, but a, um, a smart board. Say the word. They think of a synonym for it. Um, and then they, they tap it out. It's very multisensory. They give a definition. They give an opposite. And then they go on to the next word. And they, they do this routine five days a week. And I bet their ACT scores are going to go up because when you're, you're gaining all that knowledge with vocabulary, it's got to have some impact. You know, I'm sure it'll, their ACTs and their state scores are going to go up because kids are learning vocabulary and the routines are from grade level to grade level. So that's just one example of something a school can do that's easy to implement, um, but very effective. Yeah. And, you know, there is so much learning that does have to be done, both on the teacher part, the administrator part, the district part, mm -hmm. the students part, that this is something that we need to see as a long term project. Sure. It's not something that we're going to get done right away. Right. And we need to create the supports in place for, for that. And while the group, is amazing that you've created, it has so many different avenues to get information and everything. I wish it didn't have to be there. Oh, you're me. <laughs> you know, all of us do. Because I could retire. <laughs> I could really retire. <laughs> we need to get to a point where teachers aren't forced to, to change or to turn to Facebook groups to online learning that is created by, you know, an outside professional mm -hmm. and, you know, not turning to teachers to pay teachers for resources. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would love to be out of the job. Mm -hmm. I love it if children who struggle with reading don't exist and yeah. it can happen. It does take a lot. Well, I mean, there's always going to be some students that do struggle with reading. This course. is a real thing. Sure. Uh, there are other cognitive impairments that are going to cause issues, but not enough that 60% of students are struggling and not struggling. proficient readers. Yep. That's what we have in Wisconsin. 60% um, on our 2019 NAEP um, was basic or below basic. And our below basic was like 39%. It was high. So it's like, oh my. I know that a lot of concern goes to budget. How are we going to budget for this? Budgeting is always a huge issue, especially when it comes to the political side of things. Very much and so. Budgets are being cut left and right. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important to highlight that even though the beginning of this transition can take a little bit of extra money in the budget, you're going to see that repaid very quickly in, in a very quickly. couple mm -hmm. of years. And it's not just going to affect the budget for the education system. We're going to see a ripple effect mm -hmm. across things too. It's true. And, you know, really, um, it, it, there are some easy things to do that don't cost anything. What I suggested earlier, drop the three queuing, uh, find a new way to teach sight words, you know, to build the sight word vocabulary through orthographic mapping. Um, get some decodable books for the early readers and, and start applying that. I mean, it's get, get whiteboards for every classroom, for every student, and you can do you can teach kids to read by spelling, you know, it's, it's, it can happen and it doesn't cost a lot of money. You don't have to buy the, the most expensive reading program out there, but you do need to take, to train your teachers and then coach them. So, because the training has to be followed up by coaching. That's what research says. It's, it's a much more effective if you don't have coaching going on, um, you're probably not going to have a lot of effective change. And a one or a two day workshop is not going to cover all the information right. and you need real actual hands-on experience doing this mm -hmm. to 
figure out what works and what doesn't work. Because while there are important key concepts that reading instruction needs to include, there are a couple of different ways that you can effectively teach the same concept, like phonological awareness and phonemic awareness. There are different activities that we can use to help students develop these skills. Uh, Absolutely. With phonics. And just because one approach or one system, one program doesn't work for you, that doesn't mean that it's not going to work for you. I, and there's a lot on the web that's free. And it's about the teacher education. And I think that's why Facebook groups like, you know, SOR or, I mean, there's a, there's a, a lot of science of reading groups out there and we're all preaching the same thing. And it boggles my mind that teachers are going to social media to learn, to get professional development. It just, but I'm old, you know, I, I'm not of this generation that that's what, you know, I don't do TikTok. Although, you know, I'm hearing TikTok is like where it's at, right? So I can learn. There's no science of heart surgery Facebook groups where doctors <laughs> are getting the latest on their training. Good analogy. That's right. Um, and I would be very upset if my heart surgeon said, you know what? I just heard about this new new way. And in the <laughs> Facebook group, they, they have this video. So I'm going to try it out on you. And let's see how it goes, okay? No, that's, that's so not funny, fun. but it's true. Yeah. And uh, there is something that you did mention a little bit ago, and that is spelling. Now, mm -hmm. one problem with the term science of reading, which is what things are going as, is it doesn't highlight in the title that mm -hmm. it's not just actually reading that we're focusing on. We're also focusing on skills for spelling development and writing when we're including everything that is in the scope. And that's why there's sometimes uh, the use of structured literacy because it's more encompassing. It is, and, and that's true. And I think, um, you know, the science of reading movement um, maybe needs a new name because it's, um, it's not just the science of reading, you know, spelling is the reciprocal skill to reading and so it should be included like you say and as well as writing so yep and i'm guilty of it too right i mean obviously i named my facebook group that but structured literacy what i should have learned in college probably didn't have the same ring to it yeah. <laughs> you know? and there's so much opposition to various terms and mm -hmm. we're not talking, the important thing to know is we're not talking about one program. There is no science of reading curriculum and anything that sells itself as the science of reading curriculum does not exist. The budget to create such a curriculum has never been available. And you're not going to find a one size fits all program for even one aspect of this. And that's why... I'll go back to what I said. Teacher education is critical because if you have that understanding of how kids learn to read, you can adjust your instruction as you go. And you can repurpose your old materials. That's I true. Mean, teachers are incredibly creative and resourceful with mm -hmm. what they, what they have and how they can change it. And it, it's really important not to get depressed or upset. I mean, a lot of teachers, when they find out about this and they do a little bit of digging mm -hmm. and understand like, oh my God, all the students that I've taught before, like I've been mm -hmm. doing a disservice, but you can't, you can't blame yourself for that. Don't look back. Just look forward. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of the big names like Dr. Louisa Notes, Dr. Pam Kastner, like all of these big names have the same story where I didn't know it before. It, it, it wasn't in my training. And, you know, there, there's very few that are currently in service teachers that have had it from the start. I mean, we're starting to see those mm -hmm. teacher education programs that are embracing mm -hmm. it more. But even when the uh, Right to Read 
project came out, they actually looked at teacher education programs in Ontario and saw the, the problems with the curriculums not addressing what the teachers need to learn to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, there's a lot of politics involved. There's a lot of um, money involved. Uh, there's a lot of egos involved. And there's a lot of power involved. So when you put those four things together, it's not a good combination. And um, it, it, it's something that has to, time will work it out. Um, will I see it in my lifetime? You know, a huge, huge shift. Probably not. You know, I'm, I, I would love to say yes, but it's too big of a, it's too big of a nut to crack at this point. Um, but you never know. I mean, you are doing amazing work. And so that the power of one, one drop, I had gotten a bracelet from, um, another worker, um, Nora Chabazi from Ebley. And she gave, she said, I, I only got three of these and I'm giving them to the people that mean so much to me. And so she gave me this and it was so honored. And it said the power of one drop is the ripple effect. And, you know, if you, you know, if we had more of you and, you know, you, you inspire people, it just, it happens. I get, I get people writing to me almost on a daily basis and it's, you know, thanking my moderators and myself for all the time that we put into it and, and all the energy and devotion to this. And it, it makes you cry. I mean, it's just amazing what teachers are and parents have gone through and how they're changing their practice because of a Facebook group. Definitely. And I mean, the group's at almost 150,000 members, which is incredible. And think <laughs> about the impact, the hundreds of thousands of students that yeah. you have been able to touch through this group. Yeah. And I mean, to me, that would just make me burst. Right. It, it is amazing. It, 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 it is. I mean, I'm humbled by this. Um, I was looking at my analytics the other day and it's not like, it's not like people are just join and leave. We have, we had a hundred thousand people on one day. That's insane. And the average of the month was a hundred and like 32,000. So people are coming back over and over again. It's not just I sign up and I leave. It's not just in the United States. It's in Canada. It's in Australia. Right. It's all around the world. Yep. Last time I checked, we had 99 countries. I bet we have more because it's been probably six months since I looked. Um, so it's so cool. I, you know, I was in Hawaii um, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and one of um, one of our members, Emily Laidlaw, lives there on Oahu, and so. Um, she said, are you going to be around? She says, let's go out to dinner. So our husbands, you know, we all went out to dinner and she gave me a lay, you know, and it was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. It's just so cool to yeah. have people all over the world that, um, that, have, that are new, my new friends, right? Yeah. And I, you know, there's, I've been talking to people a lot since this report came out and I've started the Right to Read initiative. And it's important to make sure that people understand it's not just the English language. It's not just Canada. No, it's right. not just the United States and not just North America. This is a report that can make changes across the globe. And the science of reading or structured literacy, whatever you want to call it, whether it's a movement, it's an idea, mm -hmm. it's a practice, it's not just exclusive to one region or one language. That's right. And including phonics instruction into your teaching practices does not mean that you align with structured literacy. Exactly. Or the of reading. Including phonemic awareness. It's a, a 
whole model that has various aspects and diving into different elements and understanding that you cannot become a master of all these concepts over the summer over it's years like, it takes years and mm -hmm. I, I'm sure you would agree that you're constantly learning new things still especially now <laughs> with you know there's so much research exactly yeah. and it's impossible to actually read all the research because there's so exactly. much coming out right and understanding your own physical limits is important mm -hmm. so you don't get that burnout because mm -hmm. it is a huge field and there is so much information. So if you just focus on, you know, one or two things at a time. Exactly. That's very, great advice. It's mm -hmm. very easy to see all these science of reading book clubs that are amazing and they do a wonderful mm -hmm. job at looking mm -hmm. at these great books that are coming out. But trying to do two or three of them at once, along with living your regular life, isn't going to be the most productive use of your time. No. Filling your Amazon box or shopping cart oh, yeah. with right. all the books that you see and having them collect dust on your bedside table or your bookshelf. Again, exactly. it's going to make you feel worse <laughs> than just doing one at a time. Put them in your wish list and take the time to go through it. And, and take a training, you know, I mean... Listen to what other people have to say. Um, you know, books are great, but you, the hands-on is really important. So you understand the process and you're hearing. And, and honestly, there's so much training available online that's already recorded that you could literally do it for free and, you know, get the gist of things that have to change. And then if you want to do a deep dive, you know, there's some inexpensive courses as well that are out there um, that can help you on your journey. There's, there's a whole bunch of things out there. And if you're one of those teachers that's just kind of on the fence trying to decide, I've spoken to so many teachers that, you know, they do that moderate deep dive into it. And they're like, okay, you know what? This next academic year, this next term at school, I'm going to try it. And I'm going to see if I can make a difference. And I haven't come across one teacher yet that has regretted it. That's right. I, and, I hear about that all the time. Yeah. I, you know, I remember speaking to a teacher that she was the only one in their school. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, she started reading about it in the summer after, you know, oh, that kid's not really reading that book. You don't really know what the word says. So she looked into it over the summer. She started it in the fall. You know, she's like, oh, I've got this resource and this resource. And it's been free. I think it's the, the entire transitions cost her 150 bucks. Mm -hmm. which she didn't have to spend out of her own pocket, in my opinion. Right. Um, but you got to do what you got to do. Right. Uh, but she's seen huge improvements of her students. And she teaches a grade two class. And she's like, instead of just assuming the kids came to my class with this knowledge, I did screening. And then I used the data from the screening to tell me how to teach my class. And it turned out right. we had to go back to the beginning. And she says she's seen more progress this year so far in her class than she has in all of her other years teaching. Mm -hmm. I had one teacher reach out to me and say she was reprimanded for... Um, well, she, she actually did a, a blog and the district got wind of it and reprimanded her for doing it. And um, instead of saying, hmm, you have, you know, 30 kids in your class in kindergarten, but you have the best scores in the whole district, what are you doing? No, they, she was reprimanded for doing something different. And so many teachers get that on a regular basis. And that's why I like the recommendation in the report that says that they're not, or they should not receive any reprimands or problems because of sharing their knowledge. Mm -hmm. And it's happening. 
that they still are. And that's tragic because oh, we're terrible. trying to, you know, as educators, we're trying to do brain surgery without opening the head and helping these little guys <laughs> learn to read. Yep. And the reason why I like that analogy is because we wouldn't expect doctors to do surgery without the hands-on training and the experts sitting over their shoulder, making sure they're doing it correctly and to parachute in if something happens. Right, right. Right now you do, you know, you're, a lot of the teacher education programs are one year post bachelor mm-hmm. programs, you know, Going into your teacher education program, you have a wide range of backgrounds, which is wonderful, but it also means... I thought my dog was the only one barking. The whole time we've been on, she's been barking. Elsie, quiet. Elsie. I would tell my dog to be quiet, but she's deaf. (laughs) Yeah, no, the kids are just ringing the doorbell because they know they're not supposed to. Um, so sorry. Yes, That's okay. so doctors have professionals helping them, providing that mentorship and that guidance in the field along the way. The teacher education programs, you have that practicum, but it's very, very quick. And it doesn't allow you to adjust your practice and really learn from that teacher, at least not in the ones that I've seen and that I've been well, involved with. It, it, the other problem is, um, and we're seeing that here, um, is that let's say you go to, you know, University XYZ that um, teaches the science of reading. And then you get placed in a school district for a practicum for your student teaching. And that district uses whole language, Lucy, or, you know, FNP or whatever. And you're stuck as a practitioner. You have to do what your, um, your supervising teacher says you have to do. And so you, you are not getting a good experience and it can, it can go the other way around too, you know? So, um, that's the other thing we're trying to do here in Wisconsin is, is set up um, student teaching experiences that are aligned to the science. So what districts are using science-based instruction, evidence-based instruction, and can we get our, our teachers that are, you know, in those, those SOR programs to the, to the, you know, effective practice um, districts? You know, it's very hard because there's so few schools that are doing the doing the the actual science of reading teaching. So it's hard to find them. Yeah, and I, I know up here, um, speaking to teachers who get the the pre-service teachers for their practicums and other sponsors teachers, there are some schools that are doing more teacher education programs that are doing more aligned with the science of reading and others that aren't. And they get teachers being sent to the same district or the pre-service teachers saying, being sent to the same district. And the in-service teachers are like, we'll take them from this place and not this place. Just because of the amount no. of teaching that they have to do on the job while they're trying to teach their students and provide the mentorship required. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know it's not, it's not the best situation, you know, um, but... But, you know, there's so much to be worked out on so many levels. And that, you know, that brings us back to, you know, your right to read initiative, you know, the, um, I don't even know how many requirements, how many are there 80 or something that have to be changed in your your document, whatever. I don't know how many there are, a hundred and something. There's 157 recommendations. And it covers a, a wide range of things. Uh, going from culturally appropriate uh, practices to the curriculum, to the resources in the curriculum, to pre-service training, in-service training, diagnostics, screening. So what's your hope with that document? How do, how do we get that document um, 
to, in the hands of everyone? Well, my hope is that we see change and we don't see what's happened with things like the Rose Report and the NPR. Uh, and was it August and Shanahan that looked at second language learners and the one in Australia? I don't want this to go by the wayside. Mm -hmm. uh, because this information is very good. And I've spoken with experts around the world that have said that, look, these are valid where I am too. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel. And mm -hmm. what I'm trying to do with the Right to Read initiative is get them out there into the hands of teachers with a little bit of information as to why they are you know, the recommendations that came of this report and what we can do to make the changes needed. Mm -hmm. um, but there's so, many, so much opposition and we need to have it so that adults and the people that are in the high places are at a point where they're willing to accept that the research has changed and to be willing to move forward to do the learning that they need to do to make it better for everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, I, I just keep shaking my head. I can't understand the resistance to the level that it's, that it's at, you know, I mean, I don't know. I just don't know. I don't get it. Yeah. Well, I think it dollars, it comes down to dollars. It and does, but it's like, you know, as a practitioner, you want to do the right thing. And, and if you're not, if you're finding out that you're not, you, you know, you would want to really dig deep and dive deep into how I can change what I've been teaching to, to change that for, for my adult students and for my littles, right? Well, and the important thing to note is that while this is focusing on the primary grades, the science of reading applies to a wider range of students. And it's important for teachers in the intermediate, middle school, high school grades to understand the science because it influences their teaching. Phonics instruction isn't just those first few primary grades. Right. English language is a morphophonemic language that is quite complex, but there is logic to it. Mm -hmm. And instead of saying, well, it just is, and understanding why it is, right. <laughs> and being able to explain it to your class mm -hmm. uh, so that they can understand why words are spelt the way that they're spelt, so it can help them orthographically map it and spell it correctly. I mean, that's going right. to make your job easier, too. Right. It, right. And all goes back to teacher training. Yeah. So. So, uh yeah, thank you so much for joining me this evening. You're welcome. Really thank enjoyed you. our conversation. And I hope we can continue to broaden our reach to help more teachers, more families, and more students for years to come. I hope so too. Thank you so much for your time and, and for tonight. I appreciate it.